Good morning, everyone. This is Chaitali Bhag from the Aviation and Defense Universe European Bureau based out of Cyprus. With volatile borders, palpable geopolitical conditions, turbulent waters and warfare changing by leaps and bounds, challenges to the military of India are many and responsibilities multifold. And in this situation, our warriors in the sky, the Indian Air Force, have the task to keep the nation safe and secure despite adverse conditions on all borders. To understand these threats and Indian Air Force's changing roles, ADU is honored to have in its chat room former Chief of Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Arup Raha, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, who was the 24th Chief from 31st December 2013 to 31st December 2016. He is one person who has seen it all from a young commissioned officer to the chief and who better than him to brainstorm the situation with. We have with us Sangeeta Saxena, editor, Aviation and Defense Universe to have a chat with sir. Welcome sir, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much Atali. And uh, Air Chief Marshal Raha, what a pleasure to have you with us and a great honor, sir. And, uh, you know, no one could have been better than you for today's uh, interview. It is a run up to Republic Day, which is tomorrow. And we would like to know, you know, we have an Air Force, which is actually the best in the world. And we'd really like to know as to what are the challenges of our Air Force today Chaitali has talked about all the changing conditions geopolitically, militarily. So we like to begin with what are the challenges today, sir? And most welcome to our chat show, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to elaborate a little more on uh, the volatile borders and the geopolitical, geostrategic you know, conditions in the neighborhood, especially <clears throat> before you understand what are the challenges for the Indian Air Force? Not only the Indian Air Force, I would say the entire uh, military and of course the, uh, the government as well. So the, the volatile borders is because of the legacy of the British rule, the foreign rule for over 200 years and uh, the partition of the country, unsettled status of Jammu Kashmir, assimilation into India was challenged by Pakistan. And of course, <clears throat> Uh, the unsettled borders in the north, northeastern uh, parts of the country, along the, I would say, the Himalayan borders with China, Tibet, etc. So these are the legacies which we have acquired from our uh, British rulers, the foreign rulers. And these could not be settled even after seven decades of our independence. So uh, historically, we have been uh, in a neighborhood which is very, very challenging because of these factors. And unfortunately, we have fought or we have been drawn into conflicts by our you know, adversaries in the Western and the Northern Northeastern borders, Pakistan and China, <clears throat> I can name them, uh, you know, into various conflicts ever since we got our independence in 1947, 48, 62, 65, 71, 99, and, uh, you know, uh, despite India having no uh, uh, intentions or political, I would say that, you know, territorial ambitions, uh, we have been forced to fight wars and conflicts with these nations. So that is one thing. And now we have two nuclear weapon states as our adversaries, and they are unfortunately collusively working against India's interest. Uh, so it's a very most difficult neighborhood and obviously India has to be on the ball and uh, to tackle the challenges. The challenges imposed by the latest, I would say, by China as a rising power with a tremendous amount of economic uh, power. Uh, in last 30 years, they have progressed very rapidly and actually vaulted past Western nations, even the US in terms of economic power. And now they are closing the gap in the military and technological domains as well with the Western and the military, the Western powers. So they are becoming very, very ambitious. And I would say they are becoming very belligerent and aggressive. And their attitude towards India uh, is, is going to be more and more belligerent in the future. And Indian political leadership, diplomatic leadership, and the military leadership uh, has the challenge of 
you know, tackling the situation, deterring China and Pakistan both uh, against, uh, you know, perpetuating a conflict situation in, in this region. <clears throat> if we can develop our economy rapidly like the Chinese have done in the last three decades, we are in the same base in terms of GDP, in terms of population, etc. But they have uh, gone far ahead. I think their economy is almost five times bigger than ours because of the effort they have put in in their plans for infrastructural development and financial, you know, I would say, upliftment. And today they are the manufacturing hub of the world. So that is one aspect uh, we, we need to take care of. And if we can improve our economic situation, if our economic development, you know, rapid progress in the GDP, gross domestic product over a sustained period of time, then we'll have enough funds for our military research, development, military capabilities as well. So these go hand in hand. That's why I said CNP is the first thing we need to do. Second is that uh, to tackle the threat and deter the adversary, especially China, I would say we need enhanced bilateral, multilateral relations with the countries who are powerful, who matter in this region, and who are also suffering at the hands of China. Okay, be it South China Sea, East China Sea, neighbors, Japan, South Korea, Philippines, and uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Australia, and so many others. And third, of course, India should sell arms to the uh, you know, states, friendly nations like Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, etc., who are looking for Indian uh, armament stores, weapon systems, etc., because of the advantages uh, it accrues to them. <clears throat> so that is another issue that we need to do. And next point, as far as the armed forces are concerned, we need to increase our strategic footprint, the legitimate strategic footprint in the region. So that would mean the Indian Ocean region, Indo-Pacific region. Indian Ocean is the backyard of India. So I think we should try and prevent anybody else, any other nation, try to militarize it. And therefore, we got to have a very good presence, uh, strategic presence in the Indian Ocean region and in the Pacific region. So Indian Navy would play a very important role by adding to its fleet of warships, surface warships and submarines, especially nuclear powered submarines, even aircraft carrier. It would increase its footprint and, and presence in the Indo-Pacific and Indian Ocean region. Indian Air Force would play a very important role. We have the Andaman Nicobar Islands, and it's a very strategic outpost in the Southeast Asian region where there are a large number of choke points. You know, a lot of trade, shipping goes through these choke points, Malacca, Lombok, Sunda, and others. So it is used by not only uh, by India, but many other regional littoral states, including China. So uh, if, and the Nicobar Islands infrastructure could be developed, you know, rapidly for you know basing of our fighter aircraft, uh, maritime reconnaissance aircraft, you know, combat aircraft, air to air refuelers, you know, AOACs, etc. Uh, have missiles, air defense, uh, you know, weapon systems, edges, air defense, ground environment system. Then we would be in a position to actually increase our strategic reach in the Indo-Pacific, which is very important to my mind. And toward this, a lot of funds are required to develop the infrastructure and have the weapon platforms and systems positioned there. So that is how I think we can uh, meet the challenges in the future, especially as far as Air Force is concerned. And <clears throat> of course, we got to have- well, sir, uh, sir, one thing, one little question I'd like to ask you in between, sir, sorry to- button but you know i just wanted to understand that uh, amidst all this is there going to be a general change in the indian air force's responsibilities okay right right well you know responsibilities will really not change its responsibilities remain the same but there are new areas of warfare okay i call it the silent domain uh, you no know, space domain, cyberspace domain, artificial intelligence is used in drone warfare, etc. So these are the new challenges. So these are the new challenges in warfare. And therefore, not only the Indian Air Force, the entire military has to prepare itself 
to uh, be good at it and deter any any threats to us through the space, through cyberspace, or through use of artificial intelligence in various uh, ways to act against our interests, especially economic interests, etc. So these are the new domains: space, cyberspace, artificial intelligence, you know, Fed, you know, robotics, and other other drones, warfare, etc. So that that is uh, the important dimension to our responsibilities, not only Air Force but everybody. And the space base would mean that space based systems, satellites, you know, for communication, for targeting, for uh, you know, uh, surveillance and intelligence, reconnaissance, all these are very important space based uh, capabilities, which we have to develop very rapidly for our use for intelligence gathering, for targeting, navigation, etc. And without that, like the NAVIC, you know, that uh, we have the GPS equivalent, Indian GPS equivalent, uh, that has large number of satellites. Similarly, we'll require satellites, micro satellites, hundreds of satellites, some uh, depending on what sort of need we have uh, to actually uh, scan and monitor the TVA, tactical battle area, or area of strategic interest, maybe 24 by seven. Now we don't have such capability, therefore we require a large number of space-based assets so that we know exactly what is happening, what uh, um, the, the information that you want, the intelligence that you want, so that we are geared up, okay, to use that information uh, effectively against our adversary and prepare ourselves for any action. So this is these are the new, new domains we have to fight. And uh, next point is that we have to win skirmishes. We may not really fight a full-scale war. Uh, two nuclear power states obviously cannot really fight a full-scale war. But under the nuclear you know, uh, overhang, there will be con conventional conflict. There could be a border war. There could be a, a skirmish. So winning that skirmish is equally important, like it happened in Galwan Valley, but I think Indian soldiers uh, you know, proved better than the PLA. Similarly, uh, Balakot airstrike, etc. So the results have to be good in your favor. That means you must have good weapon systems, good weapon platforms with missiles, etc., and or PGMs, etc., so that you can get the better of the adversary in an exchange. So that is very important. That winning a skirmish is as important because nowadays, you know, with the media there, the TV news, etc., all the time trying to influence the opinion and the perception about the progress of a war, you have to win each and every skirmish. So that for you got to have the qualitative edge in terms of weapon platforms and, is, and the weapons that it carries, missiles, bombs, etc. Uh, may not be in terms of numerical superiority because with China, it will be very difficult to achieve numerical superiority. But in any particular sector, we'd have enough weapon platforms, weapon systems, which are, have an edge, technological edge on adversaries so that we can win the skirmish. Also, sir, uh, you know, in continuation to this is one thing which I wanted to, uh, you know, get, I'm sure our audience would want to understand that uh, is there a wish list we have for the Indian Air Force? which, uh, you know, we need to come uh, these new combat roles we'll have. Is there a wish list we have and which should be fulfilled? Yes, yes. No, wish list is always there. Uh, but the main constraint would be obviously the budgetary allocations. And as I mentioned, that unless you are doing financially well, if your economy is doing well, you will be flushed with funds like the Chinese are. And so they're investing huge amounts uh, the budgetary allocation is four to five times even more than India's defense budget. So they can spend a lot of money in research and development and manufacturing of equipment indigenously. And then obviously uh, they would be better off. But uh, in wish list, I would say that uh, as for the Indian Air Force is concerned, as far as Indian Air Force is concerned, we need to tackle obsolescence. You know, obsolescence is the biggest problem with aviation industry, especially military aviation, Indian Air Force, even the you know, Navy and the Army, they also have aviation wings. So the obsolescence hits uh, the state-of-the-art uh, technologies 
every decade, every five to 10 years. So you have to upgrade yourself. Either you replace them totally, or you have to uh, sort of undergo some you know, innovations, undergo some upgrade so that your weapon systems remain uh, operationally viable for the next 20, 30 years. Normal life of a weapon platform, weapon system is about 30 years, but with a midlife upgrade, which we normally do. So we have done for almost all the fleets and now Su-30s are also going to be upgraded. Mirages we have done, MiG-29s we have done, Jaguars we have done, MiG-21 Bisons we have done. So it is uh, going to happen that way. But obsolescence can be managed by procuring the equipment in time. If we can procure it from within our own resources with the Atma Nirvarta program, I think it will be very nice. But we cannot compare ourselves with the PLAF because of the muscle they have in terms of financial you know, status of that country. And they have an authoritarian regime. They can force people to produce results, work, and, but it is, may not be possible in a democracy. But uh, definitely, as I mentioned earlier, we need to have a balanced air force. Balanced air force would mean we have heavy uh, fighter aircraft like the Sukhoi 30 class. Uh, we should have medium you know, fighter aircraft. This is the combat edge of the air force, uh, which consists of uh, say uh, Mirage 2000, MiG-29, even Jaguar, and of course the latest edition is Rafale. And we have the light combat aircraft. We have the MiG-21s which are being replaced by the Tejas light combat diagram. So you could have a good mix of these three categories, uh, heavyweight, medium weight, lightweight, with the latest technologies, latest weapon system, latest you know, electronic warfare systems, so that we have a proper balanced air force. And of course, we need to make up for the numbers since we will have only about 42 squadrons of fighter aircraft uh, in the Indian Air Force, which is authorized by the government, uh, I think we'll have to make sure that we have force enhancers, like air-to-air -air refueler, like, you know, AWACS, Airborne Warning and Control System Aircraft, uh, AWC, then, uh, you know, uh, like I-Star Aircraft or ISR. So all these are going to actually enhance or multiply the capability, even of, you know, the one or two generation older aircraft, to the latest because the air defense environment or the environment that they are going to operate is going to enhance its capabilities. So that is very important that we have force enhancers in adequate numbers because we have two theaters or Northern theater and Western theater to tackle. And I'm sometimes it's called two and a half fronts because you also tackle the terrorism as well. So that is, that is how I think we have to tackle that we have a balanced system. We need to have a good air defense environment system at JIS is called, in which we have resorted to network centric warfare. Network centric war NCW capability is very important. So Indian Air Force has got the ISCCS, Integrated Air Command Control System, which actually integrates all the sensors, all the radars of the Indian Air Force, and including the Army and the Navy, they have corresponding programs and they are also being integrated with the ISCCS. So with the entire picture or airspace picture of the continent, subcontinent, the area of interest, all the time available to the decision makers to take any action that is necessary at any moment of time. Similarly, and I would say that, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we have very good leadership. We may not have a uh, full complement of equipment that we desire, the wish list is there. We'd like to have a you know uh, bomber squadron, say the you know, the, or the variety of the Tu-16 and something like that, which uh, the Chinese have, but we do not have. It will be important because a lot of assets are being tied up with strategic forces command from the Air Force uh, fighter fleet. So to release them, I think we we'll love to have a uh, you know heavy bomber squadron as well. But in terms of quality of leadership in terms of morale of our soldiers or air warriors and sailors, in terms of the skill levels, professional skill levels and training, we are far superior to, I would say the PLA, PLAN and PLF, and even uh, the, in our Pakistani forces, because ours is a professional force 
and Chinese uh, Communist Party actually has an army, navy, air force to itself. You know, that is the only only ruling party which has got the armed forces to itself. And the, the armed forces do not belong to the country. It belongs to that party to perpetuate its rule. So that is the difference. So morale is low there. The leadership is poor. And training, I think, is not up to the mark to my mind. There are other you know, sociological uh, humanitarian problems as well. So overall, I think, you know, wish list vis-a-vis -vis PLAF, uh, we may not be able to fill totally but definitely we should have the edge in terms of technology, uh, weapon systems, weapon platforms, may not be in numbers, but we'll make up with our you know, strategic planning, with our training, with good leadership and professional soldiers. Uh, sir, that was wonderful. You know, the way you've explained really makes it, you know, gives us a platform, you know, to think more about the subject. And what, what I was thinking was, sir, that with all this happening, and uh, definitely uh, there is a digital battle space nowadays. So do we need to modernize our air warriors? And if so, how do we modernize things? Okay, you know, as far as uh, digital battle space is concerned, we all understand that aviation is using the latest technology, state-of-the-art technology, be it civil aviation or military aviation, especially so the Indian Air Force, because we provide the Air Force, provide the core of uh, airspace power. And all the systems, all the equipment, all the weapon platforms are latest. And <clears throat> so therefore, uh, Indian Air Force has always been occupying the digital battle space right from the beginning. It may not be right from the beginning, but uh, for the last, I think, four decades or so, the Indian Air Force has been highly digitized you know, it is in the forefront of the digital battle space. To give you an example, you know, Mirage 2000 is four decades old now. It was inducted in 1985. So in four decades, uh, we have been using the Mirage 2000, which has got a Delta wing, and it is called a digital Delta. It has been called a digital Delta right from then, 40 years back when you acquired it from the French. So because it has got fly by wear, it has got quadruple redundancy in fly by wire system. It is all electronic, it is all digital. It's got a radar, which is digital. You know, it is it has got electronic warfare systems, which are digital. It has got you know, communication systems, which are all digital. So everything is digital. And similarly, all the acquisitions that you're making are making use of IT, ITES, and of course, digitization. You know, so that the operations become simple, maintenance becomes simple, performance is enhanced. And I must say that Indian Air Force air warriors are the best because they are dealing with it day in and day out. We are using it in maintenance activities, you know, digital uh, facilities through IT, ITAs. We do all the maintenance uh, through digitization and uh, it is so efficient and you know, at the you know, uh, press of a button, uh, you know exactly what is the status of that system, of that aircraft, of that engine, or the airframe, and things like that. So maintenance becomes very uh, efficient and easy. Uh, catering for, you know, I would say components, aggregates, spare parts, their procurement, etc., becomes easy because you know exactly know what is the stock you have. What are the shortfalls? What do you require in the next one year, two year, three year, five years time? So that is how uh, digitization is helping the Indian Air Force, especially I would say the entire military aviation to stay ahead as a, in the forefront of digital battle space. And now of course, you know, uh, I would say that uh, we have not only the flyboware, we have engines which are controlled digitally. It's called FADEC, you know, <clears throat> and a fully automated uh, DC, but, you know, digital, I think, electronic uh, system, or whatever it is, <laughs> I forget the full expansion, uh, that controls the engine performance, etc. cetera. So uh, then we have ISCC, as I talked about, is fully digitized. That means all sensors, Everything, decision making is very clear, exactly you know, ex what is happening, where, including civil aircraft flying in your airspace, the military aircraft flying, and so many other things. You can identify 
uh, a hostile aircraft very rapidly because of the digitization and integration of your air defense ground environment system and decision making is very, very easy. So that is, that is another area. And of course, um, we have ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. It's all in digital form. Whatever inputs are coming from your, uh, I would say, UAVs, which, you know, whatever information is coming through the satellites are being processed you know, digitally so that you have the information quickly. And then you can collate all the information, do analysis, and you know exactly uh, what is the status and what you need to do. So digitization, uh, we don't require any special treatment because it is part of the you know, military aviation, especially for the Indian Air Force. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Wonderful. And now we continue with something which is absolute modern day uh, warfare part. Uh, but somewhere uh, we feel that the Indian Air Force has lagged a little behind in its procurement of UAVs. So, uh, because UAV is a very major form of warfare and any military aviation organization would require it, I feel. Well, as far as UAVs are concerned, you know, UAVs have been with the Indian Air Force and the Army, later the Navy, uh, mostly, you know, equipment or UAV supplied by Israelis, uh, you know, we have the searcher and others. And now even Indian agencies are DRDO is trying to manufacture some of them uh, <clears throat> with long range, long endurance, and you can, you know, combat UAV like the Americans use and many other nations use. Uh, we are trying to get hold of them and uh, very soon we'll have this capability as well. But the Indian Air Force, especially for the last, I would say uh, 22, 22 years or so has been using the UAVs. The UAVs have infrared, electroptical and synthetic aperture radars. So they are the sensors. So UAV is airborne, floats around in the TBA, in the area of interest, and scans the target area, take picture at night with infrared camera, daytime by electroptical pods, and synthetic aperture radar uh, is used day and night both. This information digitally is downloaded, then you interpret it and get all of the information. So Indian Air Force has been using it for the last 20 years. And in fact, uh, even before that, uh, I would say another 20 years before that, Indian Air Force had been using drones as targets for our air to air missile firing. So it's not that you've not been using it, but we did not lay enough emphasis on developing our indigenous capability, even you know, though we did, but uh, some of the other DRDO labs could not <clears throat> uh, produce uh, the technologies and manufacture these uh, UAVs in large numbers, which I think with the Atman in Bharta plan and the emphasis that the government and the Ministry of Defense is laying on the DRDU and the DPSUs, et cetera, and including the private sector, you know, a lot of universities, a lot of IITs, et cetera, are getting involved in the production of drones. You know, the drones is the latest uh, induction swarms, a large number of drones being controlled by, I would say, AI, artificial intelligence, and it's creating havoc all across the world. You know about the attacks in Azerbaijan and, uh, and the adversity, Armenia, then Saudi Arabia, UAE, Abu Dhabi, et cetera. <coughs> so th th these are there. And I think we need to now produce a uh, large number of drones, large number of UCAVs, large number of UAVs, so that we are fully capable of exploiting these new technologies and capabilities for military purpose as well. Of course, civilian use is already there. And I would like to make a mention in this regard, you know, most of the military technologies are dual use technologies. So whatever you produce uh, for the military, those technologies could be gainfully used in the civil domain, be it like, you know, fighter aircraft technology, metallurgy, engine, you know, EW, instrumentation, radars, all these could be put to civil use for making, you know, transport aircraft, helicopters for 
you know, load carrying for cargo and passenger carrying and so many things. Similarly, ship, shipping industry, you know, if we have a very good base of shipping industry, be it, you know, engines for propulsion uh, or for the metallurgy that is used for building ships, etc. All this could be used for making liners, huge, you know, sea liners, sea voyages, uh, huge tanks for tankers, etc vessels so everything has got is used including you know missile technology could be used for space research for launching satellites for space travel and so many other civilian uses and civilian use of satellites is much more than military use to my mind you know surveillance for rec uh, reconnaissance of the entire forest flooding crop you know and so many other things there are so many applications so every military to my mind, every military technology that is developed could be put to a dual use, civilian use. And therefore, I think what you need is not that MOD should develop certain things, the armed forces should develop something. It has to be a whole of the government approach. You take the example of aviation industry. Do you have any capability to produce a transport aircraft, an airliner? Do you have the capacity to build an engine for a transport aircraft? We are buying from abroad. You are so dependent. So why not concentrate on this? Put all the ministries together, okay? And then build up this capability. When you have this capability in metallurgy, in electronic warfare, in instrumentation, uh, engine manufacturing, flight control system, all these things will help you produce transport aircraft. India's market is going to be huge as far as civil aviation is concerned. If as a government, we are not trying to do that, I think we are making a very huge mistake now. So that's why I say there's a need for a whole other government approach, not only in aviation industry, any industry in the civil side, you will find the application of technologies in the military. And if you have a whole other government approach, you will succeed. Then only you'll become strategically autonomous. That means you'll have strategic autonomy. You don't have to depend on others. So this is one area I think we need to work on. Right, sir. And uh, in continuation to what you've just said, sir, uh, will Atmanirbhar Bharat make in India and DRDO be sufficient to fill our deficits of the Indian Air Force, sir? Well, you know, to my mind, <clears throat> this Atmanirbhar Bharat is not totally a new concept. The new push is being given, is being you know, bolstered, it is uh, being given a new focus and that is good. Uh, policies are being changed. Things are being made easy for Indian private players to participate, et cetera, et cetera. That is very much essential. But uh, it is a concept which was there right from the beginning. I'll tell you why. The DRDO, DPSUs, D, you know, PSUs all are formed right in the beginning, immediately after independence. The people who were the statesmen leaders that time, they had a very good vision for India. They wanted India to be totally self-reliant, you know, in all respects, especially in defense needs. So DRDO was set up with more than 40 laboratories, working in various departments, carrying out research and development in military technologies, critical ones especially. And then the DPACs are set up, HL, Bell, BML and so many others, you know. <clears throat> so they was be, they are supposed to convert these technologies and manufacture goods, manufacture weapon systems, manufacture weapon platforms, weapons, radars, etc., for the Indian Armed Forces. Unfortunately, you know, uh, these organizations could not deliver fully. It could not meet the entire requirement of the armed forces. So even now we continue to buy from outside and spending a lot of monies. So if the government actually makes sure that the POMA gets involved, less bureaucratic control, technologies, uh, you know, uh, brains are being put into this uh, environment to work on these uh, critical technologies, then the DRDO will produce the technologies. The HL, Bell, BML, you know, heavy vehicles factory, they all produce the goods that the armed forces require. Not only that, we'll be able to export a lot of equipment abroad. All our neighbors, 
be in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and others even in Africa, they're keen to acquire Indian weaponry, weapon systems, because they know uh, they'll have the advantage of getting it cheap and getting it, it will be reliable. And the servicing requirement, the maintenance repair overall requirements should be made by India. When they buy from others, from the large powerful countries, uh, they, they become a pawn in their hands. You know, nobody wants to service three, four, five, six aircraft or helicopters. Their requirement is such. So requirement is less and India will be able to fulfill their requirements and look after their equipment. So it's very important that Atma Nirvarta program is given a big push and monitored at the highest level, the PMO. You know, I think uh, the success of ISRO, Space Research, Research Organization, the success of DAE, Department of Atomic Energy, are big examples. They are not controlled by the bureaucrats, the generalists. They are controlled by specific scientists, technologies, and monitored at the highest level in the PMO. The funding is given accordingly, you know. Whereas, in, as far as Atman Nirvarta is concerned, the defense, DRDO, DPSUs, and even procurement from outside when it is required because we don't have the equipment and we require it, like the Rafal. The procedure is very, very long. It is all process driven. Everybody wants to have one's back clear, tail clear, that I'll not get into trouble. No acquisition during my tenure because I don't want questions uh, being asked when I retire by the CBI and other agencies. Okay, so that is the kind of confidence, lack of confidence as people have. So it is process driven. I must be right in terms of paperwork. It doesn't matter where Indian armed forces get the capability or not whether it gets it in the due time or does it get in 20 years or 30 years when the cost escalation and time overrun is multiple times. So it is, it is a very sad state of affairs to my mind that it has to be, you know, uh, it has to be result oriented. It cannot be just process driven. Please get hold of people who will do that and not the people who will shy away from these take decisions. So that is the biggest bane in our system and i think the government needs to correct that system then only we'll be able to produce the goods that is required for this nation that was one very very nicely explained sir and uh, uh, the, the next question which is the second last question sir i would like to ask you with the taliban regime in afghanistan sir do we see a role for iaf in uh, afghanistan sir Okay, I'll, I'll come to that. I just missed out a point on the previous question. You know, how will it fill the Atman uh, Bharat program, fill the uh, gaps, deficits in the Indian Air Force? Well, as of now, in many, many areas, I think a uh, lot, of, lot of progress has been made. Uh, be it radars, or surveillance radars, acquisition radars, uh, be it, uh, I would say, electronic warfare equipment, be it... Uh, you know, uh, and, and other areas, a lot of progress has been made. So now is the time that LCA is fructifying light combat aircraft. So the low, lower uh, lightweight aircraft requirement of the Indian Air Force will be met, provided we increase the rate of production of the light combat aircraft. Now it is just about, I'm not sure if it's 16 or not, not even one squadron per year. So if you're going to replace 20 squadrons, it'll take 20 years. By then another 20 squadrons will become obsolete. So it will not do. They are making good progress. I think we need to enhance the production in that a private player. Okay, the funding assistance should be given by the government and also help should be taken from HAL and the DRDO so that this private entity also succeeds because it is the national interest. It is not private or this thing there. Why should it be with HL only? So, because they are unable to produce, they don't have the capacity. So this capacity of at least two squadrons per year is very important. LCA Mark 1A is also, I think, nearly operationalized. Very soon, I believe they'll give it to the Air Force to fly. Then um, Mark 2 is also progressing well, but I'm more interested not in Mark 2, Mark 1A, yes, because it is an immediate need that has to be you know, furbished. But AMCA, you know, medium combat aircraft, advanced medium combat, is, is going to be like, a, I would say, FGFA. Since we did not get the FGFA from the Russians, nor are we interested from the Western source, 
So we have to produce the AMCA as FGFA soonest. By 2030, if what I understand, the HL with, I mean, not HL, but DRDO and the HL with the technologies that they've already developed, they've got a big platform to launch. Launch for the next project that is AMCA. And I'm sure by 22, the actual model will be out. By 25, 26, they have done uh, a large amount of testing on the diagram, AMCA. And then by 2030, the first cotton would have been operational. This is what I expect them to do. Because if ARPAN invert us to work, then the government has to monitor it right from the top and make sure it happens. Because you spend the money now, even if you spend double the amount of money, it is going to be much more beneficial in the long run. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry. So that is another thing. So if we can produce the AMCA, it will replace the next three, four types of aircraft which will become obsolete. MiG-29, Mirage 2000, Jaguars, and Sukhoi 30s. So it, is it has to be a success or else, or else we'll never be self-reliant. We'll never have strategic autonomy in terms of procurement of weapon systems. Yes, now uh, coming to, I think Taliban you mentioned. Well, I know Afghanistan, I think there is a need to talk about Afghanistan a little bit. See, uh, I think what has happened in Afghanistan is very sad. <clears throat> uh, it is now been taken over by the Taliban. As you all know, it's an aggressive force, I would say, uh, steeped into medieval times encouraging you know a culture which is tribal in nature and uh, who believe in medieval times they do not want to give any rights to the women they want to enforce sharia which is a i think virulent version i would say and uh, not not the uh, normal the usual one so as a result the people there are going to suffer and the way it has been handled by the western powers especially the US, I think their policy as far as Afghanistan is concerned was a big folly. They, the Americans, frankly speaking, did not understand the Afghan people, their culture, their tribal nature, and the medieval uh, you know, rules, regulations, societal pattern. Uh, they wanted to impose Western culture on them. It is not possible to enforce Western culture. Afghanistan has been a uh, graveyard of uh, civilizations, you know, empires, I would say, not civilization, empires, the British Empire, the Russian Empire, many, many other empires, you know, kings and emperors uh, ran through Afghanistan, but they all lost out and they finally had to leave. And they had to run away from there because the tribal society, they are very, very strong and they have good allegiance, etc. cetera. So uh, Americans made a big mistake by engaging the, you know, the Taliban for 20 years, they did not, they thought that might, you know, the military power will win them a victory, which they did, but they did not work on the people. The welfare of the people, they could not make connect with the <clears throat> people. Uh, they could not win the hearts and minds of the people. So 20 years of their effort in building INSF, you know, their national security force, with a lot of monies and including a lot of people getting killed, not only uh, the Afghanis, Afghans, but also their own soldiers. And they had to run away from there. The chaotic withdrawal has actually resulted in a kind of victory that the Taliban is claiming uh, over a superpower. So I think Americans did not learn the lessons. They thought force will be enough to win this battle, not the hearts and minds of the people. So after 20 years of investment, they ran away from there. So now this is going to increase the radical, uh, radical forces, the terrorist organization that have been nurtured there, especially the support of the ISI and Pakistan army. Okay, so this radicalization is going to affect India as well because the state-sponsored terror groups in Pakistan and in Afghanistan are going to be facilitated by ISI and the Pak Army to start operations in Jammu Kashmir. So that is the biggest challenge as far as India is concerned, 
with the change circumstances in Afghanistan. So Jammu Kashmir will become a focus of the terrorist forces that might get strengthened in Afghan, Pakistan areas, especially in the border areas. So what India needs to do to my mind, not in the Air Force, the India needs to you know, increase or enhance is anti-terror network, anti-terror mechanism, intelligence gathering, be it any type of intelligence, especially communication intelligence, etc., signal intelligence, so that they can monitor exactly what is happening, you know, right in this belt, the Western sector, Pakistan, Afghanistan, everywhere. And they should be ready to tackle them, you know, with the knowledge or intelligence that we have would gather. So that is one thing that anti-terror network has to be strengthened. We should also sensitize our people about the dangers and how these uh, terror operatives will be functioning so that we can be more guarded about their uh, way they, they will function and we can control them or catch them before they do the damage. It's no use after they have done the damage and we uh, cry over spill milk. So that is, that is the, the second thing. As for the Air Force is concerned, you know, in anti-terror mechanism, the army has a huge role. The other security forces has a huge role. Air Force will coordinate with the army in terms of intelligence gathering with the UAVs, with space-based assets, satellites, et cetera, with the, uh, I would say, signal intelligence and communication intelligence, and also help <clears throat> in coordinating uh, operations wherever required by you know, providing helicopters, enforcing the security forces, you know, uh, with uh, more troops if required, like we've been doing in the past, uh, airlifting and a large number of uh, paramilitary forces or military uh, uh, elements into the valley and other places in JNK, whenever it was required. So that kind of activity will continue. So Air Force will not have too much of a new role, but definitely with the UCAVs, the UAVs, intelligence gathering, we could play an important role in coordination with the army to strike terrorist elements when they're sighted or intelligence about the activities unknown. So that is the way the Air Force will operate to my mind, not much of a change to my mind. But overall, the nation needs to strengthen its anti-terror mechanism in Jammu Kashmir. So that is how the Kashmir front is concerned. But you were asking me about whether Indian armed forces or the Indian Air Force will play a role in Afghanistan. To my mind, uh, the question doesn't arise as of now. Uh, I think uh, having boots on ground in Afghanistan to fight for any <clears throat> element or any section or any uh, component of the forces there, I think it will be a big mistake, it will be a folly. And there is no need, we don't have so much of interest in Afghanistan that you have to put troops on the ground boots on the ground and get involved in the imbroglio there, which you have seen how you know, major powers have lost out and run away from there. So we should not get into such a situation. But definitely, in case the government there wants Indian uh, assistance, be it uh, partly military or humanitarian, I'm sure you know, that would be done uh, in a big way and Air Force would be involved in a very big way because most of the equipment, most of the uh, no, assistance would be flown out of this country into Afghanistan in C-17s, IL-76, C-130, A-32 aircraft. But you know, Afghanistan is a landlocked country. We have to cross the airspace of Pakistan, and Pakistan being so hostile, uh, very rarely will they permit Indian Air Force planes to fly across to Afghanistan and you know take all the logistics and loads for the assistance, food, whatever it is, medicine, you know, blankets, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it depends on the situation. And otherwise, if we can get a route through you know, Iran airspace, that will also suffice, but it will be a long issue of helping Afghanistan. So to my mind, military involvement, I don't foresee. And uh, having boots on ground, I think is a no-no to my mind. And as far as humanitarian assistance is concerned, be it the current government or a future government, it will depend on the government there. If they wish, India is always ready to help. And there the Air Force will play a very important role because uh, transporting goods, uh, et cetera, uh, equipment, logistics supplies, 
by road through you know uh, pakistan would be a very difficult situation you know it is there is so much of disturbance in the border areas with pakistan and um, afghanistan it may not be very safe but definitely flights would be better choice provided and uh, pakistani uh, forces uh, clear uh, the air space for indian flights to take place right sir absolutely sir and my last question sir to you is that uh, very briefly sir if you could just tell us that uh, with growing presence uh, of china in the indian ocean and a very turbulent uh, south china sea politics so do you see a role for indian air force uh, an enhanced role for indian air force and you see more deployment of squadrons etc in uh, the uh, uh, air indian uh, territory on the indian ocean sir right you must understand what is happening in south china sea and east china sea what is the role of china in this international waters well china uh, with this newly uh, acquired financial powers uh, and its military power etc it wants to become the you know sole <clears throat> superpower uh, in this uh, in the world not only in this region in asia and it is making use of its heft you know in terms of military heft in terms of economic heft to control things in this area they become very very aggressive you know they have become very very belligerent east china sea and south china sea they have drawn nine dashes you know in international waters all along the littoral of uh, these two seas very close to the <clears throat> eez of these uh, nations Uh, drawn these lines on a map and said uh, uh, anything that is within these nine dashes in the East China Sea, South China Sea belongs to China. <laughs> so that is that is the kind of you know uh, might is right attitude they have displayed, and not only that they have already declared ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone, over the international airspace in East China Sea and South China Sea. what it means is that any aircraft that flies in this airspace which is international airspace it has to sort of inform and get permission from the chinese authorities one more you know case of you know might is right uh, third is that they are reclaiming a lot of islands you know they have tiny islands in some places a uh, reef or something that juts out during the low tide they have reclaimed these areas they have developed it into huge islands i would say set up runways military facilities port <clears throat> military installations missiles radars everything so they are made it into a solid military base from where they could operate and influence uh, or or have their strategic presence in the entire north east china sea and south china so they could have a claim on more and more territories they say that all the assets that is there are ours all the assets in the maritime domain is chinese nobody can claim so they are having you know of fights every other day with philippines with indonesia with vietnam and many other countries so that is a kind of dadagiri that is going on in the east china sea south china sea including as uh, you know sufferer is japan as well and i and of course you read every day they try to violate the airspace so because of this belligerence and aggressiveness of the you know chinese government and the i would say chinese communist party ccp and the pla <clears throat> forces uh, the situation is becoming very very critical so uh, now after having withdrawn from afghanistan the us is trying to concentrate in indo pacific they are trying to enhance its presence there which he had said that you know americans will withdraw uh, they don't want to get involved outside their continent but now they are trying to uh, refurbish their this arrangement they are trying to strengthen their presence there to counter the chinese as far as india is concerned remember i talked about the three important you know <clears throat> passages you know the straits of balaka lombok and sunda is very close to a uh, chain of islands andaman nicobar island chain very close uh, and we are going to develop this these islands with facilities 
for stationing radars, weapon systems, fighter aircraft, transport aircraft, <coughs> maritime reconnaissance aircraft, etc., etc. So that even the land-based aircraft, like the Jaguar or a Sukhoi 30, which has a huge range of operations, radius of action, it could influence uh, the strategic uh, nature of this region with our presence. So that is the important thing, that we would have land-based aircraft of the IAF and the Indian Navy, like the maritime aircraft, which would be able to monitor and make its presence felt and take action if the situation demands, if there is a contingency. Right, Secondly, sir, absolutely, sir. So one, th one uh, the last thing which I wanted to just ask is, in continuation with the same thing, that uh, how, how do you see an expansion of the number of squadrons in the region, sir, for it? In the Air Force? Well, you know, as of now, I think we are down to about 30. That's what I hear and read in the news, uh, newspapers. If it is so, obviously the obsolescence has been hitting us. We have the MiG-21s, even in large numbers. All of them need to go because they're more than four decades old, despite the you know, upgrade. Similarly, Jaguars are four decades old. Mirages are four decades old. MiG-29s are four decades old. So how much can you do with four decade old aircraft? So obsolescence has to be managed. Therefore, uh, I don't think there'll be expansion, but the government, I'm sure, will try and the Air Force will insist that you give us the 42 squadrons that the government has authorized in the past. No, 30 should become 42, and which would have, as I said, mix of heavy, medium, and light combat aircraft. It will also have a you know, strategic bomber squad. So 42 squadrons, I think, would suffice to look after two front war. That is very important. And <clears throat> second is that, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, emphasis must be laid in DRDO, DPSUs, and the private sector getting involved to produce aircraft in a time-bound fashion. Produce force and answers like we are doing. AOX, AWC, we are manufacturing, we're not manufacturing, we're converting transport aircraft that you bought from outside <laughs> into airborne platforms for surveillance and control. So I think that process should continue. And as and when we develop an industry, aviation industry, where I can manufacture our own uh, aircraft, not only combat aircraft and combat helicopters, but also transport aircraft. I'm sure we can convert those transport aircraft into air-to-air -air refueler, airborne warning and control system aircraft, AWC aircraft, and I star aircraft, you know, reconnaissance aircraft, and maritime reconnaissance aircraft. So that is I right, think, how you go about it. Right. Sir. sir, this was so absorbing and so exhaustive, and it was wonderful. You know, I'm sure the audience will just love the way you've explained everything to us, sir. Sir, wonderful to have you on ADU's chat room, sir. And uh, we're uh, you know grateful that you could take take out this time from your heavy schedule. And uh, we also would like to, uh, you know, thank you for uh, explaining things which, you know, explained Indian Air Force in its complete perspective. So, uh, as uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Jai Hind, along with a very happy Republic Day, sir. And thank now we take much, you back you, to our, <laughs> right, sir. Right. And, and we take Ketali, you back thank to you very much. Studios. I also enjoyed the event and I'm sure, I hope it is uh, useful to all of you. And yes. do let me know if you have any any feedback to give. Right. Thank you. Jai. Right, sir. Absolutely, sir. We take you great. Sir. We'll now take you back to uh, Chetali, who is in the Cypress Studio, sir, and uh, right. she'll uh, wrap up the interview for us. Okay. Thank you very much. As ma'am said, it was exactly very exhaustive and very absorbing. I'll use the same adjectives. And sir, yes, it was a real privilege for us to have you at the chat room and uh, to know so many things about Indian Air Force. I'm sure our audience will be very interesting to hear all this from you. Thanks a lot. And we look forward to see you again in the chat room, sir. Thank you. Happy Republic Day, Jai Hind, sir. Thank you, Chitali. All the best. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Right. Right. Uh